Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome back. So, uh, in the last uh, uh, few classes, we have discussed about uh, gas turbine combustors, in particular aerospace gas turbine combustors. Okay. And uh, we have seen uh, how the different parts are connected together, like how diffuser, uh, the combustor liner, all those things uh, are connected, and how uh, the uh, the uh, the flow is essentially split into the primary zone, into the dilution zone, uh, etc., and which eventually determines the final um, uh, final uh, temperature profile that goes into the turbine. Okay, but as such, the main thing was that. Uh, that the temperature profile uh, at the exit of the combustor is of very high importance and uh, as such uh, the maximum temperature though is uh, is useful towards uh, we, uh, though we want to maximize the temperature because that causes increase in the cycle efficiency that is essentially limited by that uh, the, 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 the material properties and the coating properties of the turbine blades. Okay. As such, as a result of that in the combustor, the overall uh, fuel uh, air, uh, the actual fuel air ratio divided by the stoichiometric fuel air ratio which is the equivalence ratio, the overall equivalence ratio remains very lean 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 something like that. And uh, the, the, the air fuel ratios are always very high, much much higher than the stoichiometric values. Okay. So, as a result there is lot of oxidizer, lot of air uh, still left and which can be utilized uh, for further burning. Okay. But the reason why we cannot burn more fuel inside the combustor is that if you burn more fuel inside the combustor then the temperature the, that will, will be approach the stoichiometric adiabatic flame temperature and uh, that is not acceptable by the turbine blades. So, uh, even though there is air present, excess air present inside the gas turbine, the main gas turbine combustor, uh, you cannot uh, utilize that because your uh, turbine inlet temperature or the turbine entry temperature is limited by the material properties. So, there is a lot of air. So, the question is that in cases where you need extra thrust, suppose you are, uh, you are, uh, you are using a military gas turbine, military, uh, uh, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are designing an engine, a uh, gas turbine engine for military applications. Okay. So, where the, uh, where the aircraft might need to accelerate, might need to take sharp turns, uh, might need to uh, climb up. Uh, in in uh, in very rapidly, so you need all these maneuvers, ex, uh, all these like uh, uh, extra vang and maneuvers needs uh, extra thrust. Okay, so uh, what can one can do is that one can utilize this excess air that goes out of the gas turbine engine and burn fuel in this excess air after this excess air comes out of the uh, turbine. All right, so that is what exactly the purpose of an afterburner. So, the afterburner essentially uh, as you see the afterburners are essentially is a long uh, pipe which contains the air that goes out of the um, your uh, turbines and you dump fuel in there. Okay, you spray fuel in there and you essentially um, uh, burn the fuel there and uh, you generate extra thrust by accelerating the hot gases that comes out through a nozzle. Okay. So, uh, that is what an afterburner uh, does and uh, but the thing is that here this uh, the flow uh, that the afterburner encounters comes out of the turbine. Okay. So, it is already expanded. So, as a result uh, on one hand it is uh, vitiated that it contains some amount of uh, combustion products that comes out of the gas turbine engine and on the other hand it is uh, also the flow velocities are higher. So, uh, one big challenge in this afterburners is flame stabilization. And even more so because you are using this uh, afterburners in kind of uh, short intervals where the flame, uh, where, the, where the aircraft can accelerate. So, the acceleration in the aircraft can also cause acceleration in the airflow inside the afterburner. So, the afterburner sees a stringent uh, conditions in terms of flame stabilizations. So, in this topic, in this uh, module what we will look into is that 
we will look into understanding flame stabilization and blow off in prototypical afterburners and using laser diagnostics. So, this, this uh, module is rather unique this next uh, 3, 4 classes that we will go through um, uh, uh, is, is rather unique because it does not really uh, it talks about many things. It essentially tries to understand a very important combustion problem that is flame stabilization okay, and blow off in a in this kind of a, a, a rather a prototypical con configuration in a practical uh, kind of configuration using laser based diagnostics. Okay. So, here we are going to introduce uh, this uh, cutting edge uh, diagnostic techniques uh, called laser diagnostics in particular laser induced fluorescence and particle image velocimetry which can be utilized towards understanding some particular uh, uh, phenomena that happens in a practical engine. So, this course essentially will cover many things, but I hope you will enjoy this course because uh, as such this class will cover many things because on one hand we will talking about a practical system, on the other hand we will talking about a practical problem because flame stabilization and blow off is indeed a practical problem in the in the afterburner and then we will attack that problem, we will try to understand that problem using um, this uh, experimentations laser based diagnostics and we will show you that how this complex engine condition can be simplified into smaller configurations in an experiment in a laboratory experiment and then once we develop some understanding of that laboratory experiment, we can construct bigger facilities in which we try to understand this thing. So, this will be like an amalgamation of different things like uh, practical uh, engines, afterburners, laser based diagnostics. Uh, so, as such uh, uh, and uh, blow off experiments in small scale burner and blow off experiments in uh, uh, prototypical combustor. So, this is uh, we will try to cover uh, quite a few ground here and this will be of a little bit different test than what we have done before, but also here as such in this whole course we have never compromised on the rigor. Uh, we have always done uh, deeper analysis uh, by in a simplified uh, system. We will also do that same thing that is we will try to we'll, instead of just describing that um, uh, to do laser induced fluorescence you need a laser, you need a camera etcetera. We will tell you what is the principle behind laser induced fluorescence so that um, we develop this uh, concepts from a very fundamental uh, viewpoint. Okay. So, here is the outline. Okay. So, uh, so first we will go about uh, uh, this uh, flame stabilization as such which is a very rich topic in uh, and uh, it uh, has been studied by combustion research for decades and you will see that uh, the flame stabilization is indeed uh, in is indeed uh, involves quite a few things. It in indeed involves uh, like understanding will involve like uh, you have to understand how combustion happens in a in a practical flow. Okay, mm, uh, that is uh, typically we used uh, flames are essentially stabilized in shear layers. So on one hand, we will need to understand properties of shear layers like different kinds of vortex shedding. Uh, when you know, the vortex shedding that can happen in a reacting flow, vortex shedding that happens in a non-reacting flow. Okay, and uh, then we will uh, look into the properties of the flames. We'll see how flames it changes with different conditions and how uh, uh, flames can extinguish by stretch rates etcetera. So, it is a combination of many things and as such all this um, understanding of uh, combustion that we have uh, developed so far um, will essentially feed into this uh, this topic. So, many things will, will essentially goes into uh, successful flame stabilization and that is the purpose of this um, uh, this few lectures. And then oh, the outline is that we will go into look into afterburners uh, because that is the that is the practical application that we have in mind in flame stabilization. Of course, uh, flame stabilization you have to understand that flame stabilization is a very very important uh, uh, requirement in in high speed propulsion systems in ramjets and scramjets. Okay, so uh, those configurations uh, might be a little bit different because uh, in a scramjet, for example, you use uh, you have to flames uh, you have to stabilize the flame in a supersonic flow. So uh, fundamentally, there can be some differences, but still the understanding that developed here will go a long way in describing those phenomena as well as we will see later. Okay. So, then uh, first we will go into afterburners and then we will go into laser diagnostics principles of uh, laser based diagnostics, how do we do, uh, what is the fundamental principle behind laser induced fluorescence and how do we do laser induced fluorescence and then we will go into look into bluff body stabilized flames. We will assess the development in the field for the last uh, uh, of say 50 years in a very short, in a, in a very brief review and then we will go into uh, the recent works by Lewin's group in Georgia Tech and then we will go into uh, our works at uh, University of Connecticut from Seligen's group uh, where we will use chemiluminescence imaging and PIV and PLIF uh, etcetera. And then we'll also focus on some of these works uh, uh, using a high-speed PIV brief. And then uh, we'll go into understand uh, force blow-off and blow-off in vitiated flows. Okay. 
So, uh, then uh, we will uh, look into also blow off in uh, small stabilized flames uh, once again from uh, uh, Georgia Tech as well as from uh, DLR group. Okay. So, these are the uh, these are the topics that we will cover, but uh, this is of course, uh, outline um, is a, is a overall outline and uh, we will spend quite some time on uh, laser based diagnostics to understand what are the fundamental principles behind it. Because uh, here we will talk about an unique uh, uh, situation where we will use these diagnostics to essentially solve a particular uh, problem that we encounter in combustion. So, we will we will solve how basically flame uh, uh, blows off. Uh, using this laser based diagnostic. So, uh, and that how this flame blows up in a prototypical afterburner configuration. So, that is the whole um, aim of this talk. So, this is how uh, 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 after burning turbofan jet engine looks like. So, the previous jet engine uh, that we had shown you uh, that uh, the turbo jet engine was uh, essentially uh, 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 was an engine with, with which did not have this part. Okay, so, which did not um, have this, uh, this part if you remember. I will come to this part, but, uh, 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 but before that let me just uh, once again describe to you. So, here you have the in the front you have the fans and then you have the compressors, uh, a few stages of compressors and then uh, here you have the, the, the combustion chamber. Uh, which we discussed uh, so far that is the this is the main gas turbine this is the main combustion chamber ok. Um, uh, this, is the, this is the main combustion chamber and uh, this is, is essentially your fuel nozzle ok. The, so, the fuel is injected from here the liquid fuel comes into through here and it is injected through here and it is uh, goes into a spray like this ok. And uh, it is of course, small and this is your igniter. Uh, which is placed uh, uh, here and then of course, the flow the hot flow goes out and uh, hits the turbine blades and turns the turbine blade uh, and uh, which and the turbine blades in turn uh, rotates the compressor blades because they are connected on the mounted on the same sh same shaft ok. And now what happens? Now, in an ordinary uh, in a um, like a commercial jet engine you are uh, you just now expand the flow through a nozzle and uh, uh, that is it ok. But here what you have is that you have this full thing which is called the afterburner. And the why we need the afterburner is already described previously that we in sometimes uh, in a situation where you need a very sharp climb, um, uh, well, you need to uh, where, where the aircraft needs to climb very quickly, where it needs to it needs some excess thrust. Uh, so, then you turn this afterburner on which uh, develops uh, which burns the fuel in the oxygen rich in the in the in the oxygen uh, rich vitiated air. Uh, because uh, as you remember here the burning happens in fuel lean. So, the, the, the air that comes out here ok, the air that comes out here is uh, the air is essentially vitiated because it contains products. So, with lot of oxygen ok. So, what you do here is that the air that comes out of the turbine is essentially uh, uh, vitiated air it contains products like CO2, CO uh, some amount of CO it can contain it of course, contains water vapor and it can contain other some pollutants in small amounts and uh, but mainly it contains uh, quite some amount of oxygen because um, uh, what you had here was fuel lean combustion. So, uh, now what you do is that through these fuel spray bars so through these fuel bars these are these fuel bars you basically inject the fuel. Okay, and uh, then uh, these fuels, uh, this uh, this this forms a fuel air mixture here. Okay, this this mixes with this uh, this uh, this fuel mixes with this uh, 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 this uh, fuel mixes. Uh, this uh, fuel mixes with the air here. Okay, and uh, in these regions, and the flame essentially can be stabilized like this. Okay, mm -hmm. these are this uh, V gutter after burners you see here. So, this is uh, this, this is the, the flame holders essentially these these are the things of the flame holders ok. So, these are the and the flame is uh, in the wake region of this uh, this uh, flame holder this bluff body flame holder the flame is stabilized ok. And then of course, you expand it through a nozzle to develop the thrust. Okay. So, uh, then uh, we go on to this thing. So, this is how a flame in an afterburner looks like ok. So, of course, the aircraft is, uh, is uh, moving in this direction and the flame as you see goes out here and uh, this is uh, from a cavity engine uh, uh, afterburner 
um, that you see here. So, uh, so it the exact nature of the flame depends uh, on the state of mixing, but here you see a blue flame. So, uh, often the flame actually is quite close to a premix flame uh, because uh, because of the because of the sufficient distance. If there is sufficient sufficient distance between the fuel spray bars and the flame holders, then the fuel um, air mixing can be uh, can be complete. And of course, you see this is a very vitiated, strongly vitiated high temperature environment in itself. This is a very uh, uh, so uh, the fuel uh, can uh, the, the the liquid fuel can evaporate very quickly, and if it mixes, uh, it can essentially um, uh, can uh, it can essentially burn in a close to premix mode. But of course, uh, you will see a lot of like a yellow flames coming out of the afterburners also, which shows that it is essentially in non premix mode. So, so this is uh, what we are going to study that uh, uh, that uh, uh, basically flames in afterburners. Okay, now. So far, we have studied a lot about combustion, okay, uh, but we have not really discussed any experimental techniques to measure things in a combustion. Now, if you want to, um, uh, if you want to talk about measurements, the first question is, is that what do you want to measure in combustion? So, what is most important in combustion? As we have discussed before, in combustion is essentially stands on two pillars: one is uh, chemical kinetics, another is fuel fluid mechanics. Okay, so chemical kinetics essentially talks all about the different uh, the breakdown uh, how essentially the fuel uh, uh, breaks down into smaller and smaller uh, units and then it essentially oxidizes to form the products through a series of um, elementary reactions. Okay. So, uh, in that sense we know that uh, the one of the most important things that we have come to learn using this chemical kinetics is the role of the intermediates right role of the radicals and uh, as you see uh, one of the most impor important intermediates in combustion is this hydroxyl radical. H is also very important the H atom and the O atom is also important, but hydroxyl radical is also very important. So, if we can say that um, if the question arises that what do we experimentally what how to uh, experimentally obtain the reactive scalar concentration or, or the first question is that what do you want to measure suppose then uh, we want to measure then uh, if if we uh, that is the case suppose uh, we, uh, we we want to uh, measure uh, some uh, some radicals okay so what is the most important radical of course h can be a very important radical but that is very hard to measure uh, o is also hard to measure uh, so it's not only that you want to measure something important it has to be measurable also okay and you have to measure it in a way so that you do not disturb the flow inside the combustor so you cannot really have a probe have a big probe if you are sitting inside the combustor which distorts the flow itself okay anything you see if i put a if i put a probe here first of all putting a physical probe is difficult but even in a in a in a in a normal laboratory setup if you want to put a physical probe here that will disturb the flow it will act like a block body okay and it will can cause a lot of heat loss etc so um, we want to measure things in a non intrusive manner that is we do not want to put a physical probe, but by shining light and by getting some signatures how uh, some molecules interact with the light that we send in we want to measure their uh, presence. So, to in, in, a, in a more formal language basically we want to measure the concentration of some active radicals. Okay? We want to measure the species concentration of the some reactive scalars. So, which reactive scalar do we want as we remember that the one of the most important uh, reactions in uh, combustion was H plus O 2 going to O H plus O. Okay. This was the most important um, uh, chain branching reaction that we encountered in uh, and that we encountered in combustion. So, uh, one of the product of this most important reaction is O H okay. and let us say then uh, let us uh, one of the most important things we can measure in combustion which will tell us something about the kinetics something where the reaction is happening something where the flame is that is uh, where the flame is located. So, uh, so if we we can say that uh, where where we have uh, a sharp increase in OH we, we can say that the flame is located at that point. So, as a result of that it is worthwhile to measure the OH concentration in a combustion environment. So, let us say we want to measure the mole fraction of OH in a given flow. Okay. So, suppose we have a bluff body like this the flow is coming here the flame is stabilized like this. So, OH will be formed uh, somewhere we want to measure the OH concentration. Okay. Now, how can we experimentally obtain this reactive scalar concentration as I said 
we cannot really I mean uh, put a physical probe inside uh, because of because the environment is also harsh and um, uh, and then we uh, the actual measurements are difficult to obtain. So, let us say uh, we want to talk about now that how can we uh, measure uh, the, uh, the concentration or the mole fraction of this hydroxyl radical using laser based diagnostics. So, that is the most important uh, part of this uh, uh, class. So, if we recap that uh, to, to justify why we want to measure OH, you see uh, this was the recap, uh, this is a recap from the chemical structure of laminar premix flames which we discussed uh, for several weeks ago. Mm, uh, so, uh, this was the uh, premix flame and this uh, came from detailed kinetics and this is the temperature and you see OH, uh, this is the OH profile. Of course, uh, you see that there is uh, 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 like a uh, mm, uh, 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 this is the actually the the, the OH profile of a of a in a, in a hydrogen flame. So in a hydrox in a if it is in a in a in a methane flame, the OH profile looks looks something like this. Okay. So you see that uh, what happen what is happening here is that this we have got uh, some uh, for downstream we also have got OH, but the point where the OH increases sharply. Okay. The point where the OH increases sharply that can be essentially called the flame location. Okay. So, uh, we, the, we can say that the maximum gradient of OH, okay, we can say that the maximum gradient of OH is essentially corresponds to the my start of the flame that, that essentially corresponds to the flame front. So, so, the if I can measure OH, it will can tell me two important things. It can tell me of the extent of the reaction on one hand of the most important reaction of H plus O2 going to OH plus O and on the second hand. Uh, the more importantly, uh, it will tell me if I can identify the region where OH increases very sharply inside a flame, uh, inside the flow. So, I can consider that contour which corresponds to the maximum gradient of OH to be essentially my flame front. Now, typically in experiments, you do not have resolution of this order that is um, you do not have uh, so high resolutions um, in, in the essentially turbulent flame experiments. So, this essentially looks like a looks uh, like very sharply uh, this OH essentially goes uh, very, very, uh, very sharply like this. Okay. So, we can essentially find out the maximum gradient of how OH uh, is distributed in the in the in a in a in space in essentially 2D space and from that uh, we can find out the location of the flame. So, uh, using OH we can very precisely and instantaneously using OH uh, if we can have the OH concentration the distribution of the OH concentration in a f in, in space in, in, the, f in a, uh, the, the field distribution of OH in space in a combustor then from that we can easily find out the location of the flame. Okay? So, that is very important and then from that we can find out how the local flow field looks like etcetera and also it will tell you how the extent of the reaction uh, ha happens in this uh, in um, this kind of environment. So, this is uh, OH measurement measuring, measuring OH has been a very important um, uh, uh, activity of combustion researchers for, uh, for, for quite some time. So, let us see what is the basic principle behind OH. So, the OH we can measure the, the concentration of OH of the hydroxyl radical uh, using this uh, principle called uh, laser induced fluorescence. It is essentially an experimental technique um, involving uh, fluorescence uh, and uh, uh, what we have here is that uh, we will use this uh, principle of uh, we will use this uh, technique of laser induced fluorescence to measure the concentration or the mole fraction of OH. Now, how this is done? Okay. So, uh, as you see here, uh, so this let us consider that this is essentially a OH radical, okay. uh, this is H, this is O and it is uh, essentially in a, in a uh, like a lower energy state, uh, lower electronic state given by E0. And this is how a potential well uh, looks like and in this electronic state there are like several uh, other states of like uh, rotational states, vibrational states and these are the corresponding wave functions. Now, this will involve a little bit of like uh, terms from quantum mechanics etcetera. I am just using them uh, here for uh, the, com the sake of completeness but um, uh, and this will uh, in, a, in a very basic in a very simplified manner I will try to introduce what is uh, laser induced fluorescence. Okay. So, uh, please bear with me and uh, so, this is the uh, this is the row vibrational um, uh, this is the electronic uh, uh, ground state and these are this uh, new double dash 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, these are the different vibrational states. Okay? And these are the different vibrational wave functions. So, now suppose this OH molecule is, is uh, residing at a ground state at new dash double dash equal to 0. 
Now, when uh, suppose there is an incident laser that comes in light, so the light OH absorbs the light, it goes promoted to the higher energy state, okay, and then what happens is that it uh, interacts with the neighboring molecules or go undergoes some interact some intersystem crossings, and then it gets in that higher electronic state, it goes down to a uh, from the higher uh, vibrational state in the higher electronic state, it comes down to a lower vibrational state in the higher electronic state and eventually because it is uh, more stable at the lower uh, electronic state, it comes down to the lower electronic state, but while coming down it emits this excess energy in form of a photon and this photon is essentially the fluorescence. Okay. So, this is the principle of laser induced fluorescence. I will just repeat once again. So, uh, this OH is residing at the lowest vibrational state of the lowest electronic state. Okay. Incident laser comes, OH absorbs light, promote it to a higher electronic state, intersystem crossing goes down to the lower vibrational state, to the lower electronic state, and, and while doing that, it emits the uh, uh, fluorescence. So, there are essentially this large jump that it makes okay, and because of the large energy difference between the two electronic state, it essentially emits a photon and that photon is essentially the, uh, the, the laser the emitted fluorescence or the laser induced fluorescence that we are talking about. Okay. So, that photon essentially is essentially light. So, you can collect this light using a photomultiplier or using a CCD camera and the idea is that that once you know the intensity of this light, you can correlate that intensity of the light with the population of the OH radicals that was present in this ground state before it was hit with the laser. Okay. So, once again you see I uh, will just repeat this because this is so important. So, incident laser comes. So, this is the OH uh, uh, um, uh, radical or the OH molecule uh, which was uh, in the lower electronic state or the lower energy state. Laser comes in, it absorbs the light to gets promoted to higher electronic state, intersystem crossings gets down to the lower electronic state, emits the fluorescence and then once again comes back to the original state by intersystem crossings. Okay. So, these are not uh, really important right now, these are uh, different uh, that is the transition within the same uh, uh, electronic states are not important, but uh, there are two things here. Number one you see that this energy level in this energy coordinate is much greater than this energy level. So, the energy absorbed is greater than the energy released in terms of photon and that is because some energy is lost in this intersystem crossings. Okay. So, as a result of that because the emitted energy is less than the absorbed energy, the emitted wavelength in fluorescence, laser induced fluorescence is always greater than the absorbed wavelength. Now, there are several questions that what determines that whether this, uh, this OH will absorb the light and will get promoted to the higher electronic state. It is not if you just uh, if you have an OH formed in the, in the in the in the in the in a in the in a flame and we shine uh, just normal light into it, of course it is not going to absorb and show you the fluorescence. So there are specific rules okay by which the um, OH can absorb a given light or given a wavelength of a given light uh, or, or a OH can absorb wavelength and basically it depends on the energy and uh, essentially it means uh, it comes down to the fact that this wave function that you have here and this wave function that we hear that they should have significant overlap. So, the promoted state wave function and the ground state wave function if they have similar if they have high overlap then the OH is in a state is in a conducive state to absorb the photon or absorb the incident uh, laser beam and it can get promoted. And now once it get promoted it is of course, uh, it will come down and uh, um, while coming down it emits the fluorescence and if we can collect that light and uh, then that light. Um, we can essentially correlate it to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, number of uh, OH molecules that are present. Okay. So uh, one principle that we have to uh, uh, that is assumed in this uh, laser induced fluorescence is essentially called the Frank Condon principle, and it means that the time for electronic transition is much greater than the nuclear response. So which means that the nucleus uh, of this OH uh, uh, does not change uh, or does not move while this electronic transitions happen. That is, the electronic transition is most likely to occur without changes in the position of the nuclei in the molecular entity and its environment, and the resulting state is called the Frank Condon state, and the transition involved is a vertical transition. Otherwise, if this if the nucleus is moved uh, 
uh, during this transition happening then this uh, this we could not have overlapped you know, these two uh, uh, these two potential wells like this okay uh, so uh, this is just the basic principle now in the, ne in the next class we'll come down and uh, we'll come back and discuss uh, more about uh, uh, this uh, mm, uh, laser induced fluorescence and quantitatively how we can extract uh, by collecting the light from the intensity of the light how we can tell that the intensity of the light corresponds to what mole fraction of OH because that is the thing right. So, essentially what it means that we are we have a we have a flame we are shining light uh, 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 shining a laser light at a particular wavelength we need to shine it at a particular wavelength and that is why we need a laser. So, it shine the light shines on the molecules of OH that is present inside the OH absorbs get promoted to an excited state and uh, uh, undergo some intersystem crossings and then it gets uh, demoted to this lower uh, electronic state and while it gets demoted because of the energy level difference it gives out a photon and uh, this uh, photon we can collect and uh, by the number of photons that is being collected which is essentially the intensity of the light we can correlate it to the mole fraction of OH that was present at the time when this laser light hit the OH in first place. Okay. So, that is essentially the uh, uh, number of uh, OH molecules or the mole fraction of OH molecules that is present in my flame. So, that is what I want to know and uh, we will go into a little bit of details that uh, how we can uh, find that out. Okay. So, that will be done in the next class. Thank you.